In our series on how to manage disaster relief grants, we hope to help you and your community benefit from FEMA grants. By studying public assistance eligibility, you will learn how to get FEMA funding for COVID-19 response in your community. This episode asks the following questions. Are you eligible for a FEMA grant? Are you eligible for a FEMA grant for COVID-19? Are you eligible for a FEMA grant for COVID-19 response? We will help you answer these questions by exploring the rules on eligibility as described in the FEMA PAPPG, the Papa G. My name is Christina Moore. My team and I at Storm Petrol have responded to natural disasters since 2012 as experts in FEMA grant management and providing federal grant management training. We are providing these materials to you, hoping that you can help your community, your organization survive this disaster and wisely execute the mission before you. If you appreciate this presentation, please share it. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell. We've invented this fictitious game called FEMA Quest. This series will help you confidently navigate the rough terrain ahead and thrive while managing a FEMA grant. But who gets to play? Are you eligible for a FEMA grant for COVID-19? If you're allowed on the playing field and you plan to ask for money, you must qualify as an eligible applicant. It's a pretty binary situation. You is or you ain't. So an organization either qualifies as an eligible applicant or it does not. That's barrier number one. Barrier number two to playing FEMA Quest involves the facilities involved. This is a little less interesting with the 2020 COVID-19 disaster response, but it is a critical rule for weather-based disasters. If you get through those two, you're on the FEMA Quest map. Your mission, the work you perform, and the materials you buy must align to one, perfectly with the scope of the disaster and the scope of work authorized by the FEMA grants, two, be necessary, and three, reasonable. This is the outline of this episode. Applicant eligibility, facility eligibility, and work eligibility. Ugh, I've been on phone calls and in rooms where the use of the word applicant becomes contentious. So I'll digress for a minute on this term. A few years ago, the United States federal government endeavored to unify the grant management rules so that all agencies and all programs executed their processes consistently. This unified set of rules is called 2 CFR 200. In this august body of words, the authors used sub-recipient, an awkwardly precise term. A sub-recipient is a grant applicant who receives their funds via a recipient. A recipient is often a state agency who administers the grant on behalf of the federal agency. I don't care much about the word. Applicant is a lovely, accurate word, and it's so easy to say. An applicant submitted an application for a grant. Recipient is a nice word, too. A recipient is an applicant who has, or very likely, will be in receipt of grant funds. A sub-recipient is an applicant and a recipient. See, a sub-recipient submitted an application, and a sub-recipient will also be in receipt of monies. FEMA's publications use the words nearly interchangeably. The FEMA PAPPG, the Papa G, certainly calls those who apply for grants applicants. Pick your word, be flexible, Celebrate the diversity that people bring to any process and be kind to each other. There are no points given for any player arguing over sub-recipient versus applicant. There are way more interesting arguments to have. This isn't one. What makes an applicant eligible? The prime directive is an applicant must be a nonprofit organization. Is Storm Petrol a nonprofit organization? No, we're not. So we're not eligible. Is the city of New York a nonprofit organization? Yes, it is. Could be eligible. You is or you ain't. It's a pretty binary discussion. Organizations that are nonprofit file specific forms with the IRS. There are a dozen types of nonprofits. The IRS code is filled with them. There are nonprofit ambulance services and there are for profit ambulance services. There are for profit water districts and nonprofit water districts. Being a nonprofit organization is only the first test. In the next test, we'll ask if you're a government or not. Sadly, this is not binary. Well, it kind of is, but the answers can be very, very complicated. Some organizations are clearly governments. The town of Halifax, Vermont, this is a government. The borough of Anchorage, Alaska is a government. 
Our great nation is founded on so many diverse cultural influences. I love this diversity. I've been getting to know New Mexico a bit through our contract with that great state. I'm humbled. Ancient Native American traditions stand proudly, as well as some Mexican traditions, Anglo-American traditions. When forming governments and government-like organizations, sometimes these traditions blend and sometimes they do not blend. I know enough not to bring my very New England Yankee understanding of government to this corner of our shared country. During my decade in Alaska, I worked for Alaska Native Medical Center and the U.S. Public Health Service. I also worked for three regional health organizations. I know enough to declare I cannot define a government. Louisiana carries traditions of French common law, and here in Vermont, Massachusetts, we're firmly embedded in English traditions from the 1600s. If you're a government, then you're an eligible applicant. These include school districts, municipalities, intrastate, interstate organizations, and other odd entities. If you've been previously defined as a government by FEMA, then you're likely all set. If FEMA's never heard of you, set up a meeting to discuss the situation. You be you and prove how your organization is a government. Uh, I mean, if you are. That's test number two. It's really easy for so many cases. And then there's that one situation where it isn't. You'll gather your evidence. You'll read the rules in the FEMA Papa G. You'll contact peers in your region and across the nation. Good grant management teams are helpful and effective in their communities. In the next episode, we show you how to build one. To recap, for-profit versus non-profit. If you're for-profit, you'll be excluded from the FEMA Public Assistance Grant Program. The clue is in the name, public, government, or non-governmental non-profit organization. If you're a government, then you're eligible. So what's left? Non-governmental non-profit organizations. In casual speech, many Americans would say NGO, meaning non-governmental organization. The UN introduced some precision to the definition of NGO. It's really, really close to what FEMA means with PNP, private nonprofit. What is PNP in FEMA lingo? It is a non-governmental, not-for-profit organization that provides essential government-like services. This is the land of many discussions and arguments. Is there one key phrase that makes PNP eligible or not eligible? There is. It's public. If your organization provides an essential, public service to the general public, then you are likely an eligible applicant. Let's be extremely clear. FEMA makes these determinations. In the early hours of a disaster, FEMA tosses PNP to the ignore pile aggressively. In time, they come around and sort through the PNPs and make determinations. Hang tight. Their first word is never the final word. If your services match their definition of essential or critical, and your nonprofit. FEMA will come around with time and a bit of a gentle nudge. I applaud FEMA's efforts to ensure that our tax dollars for public assistance hit their intended target. Yes, there is a frayed edge with organizations that provide great services and don't classically fit into the neat definitions FEMA offers. You'll have to wait patiently for a ruling. If this is you, then behave as if you're eligible. Use the federal procurement rules. Log your time. Calculate your fringe benefit rates. Behave exactly like an eligible applicant should. If the ruling is in your favor, you didn't blow up your chances for reimbursement. If you insist you're an eligible PMP and then you disregard the federal procurement rules and you don't log your labor and equipment correctly, you sunk your own battleship. You fought to be a player in the game of FEMA Quest, then by ignoring the rules, you walked away. You cannot have it both ways. We have a handout with lovely lists of likely eligible things for you to download. And this is in the Papa G on pages 10, 11, and 13. Let's touch on a few. Is a for-profit hospital eligible? No, it is for-profit. Is Brattleboro Memorial Hospital a likely eligible facility? Well, according to their website, it is a 61-bed not-for-profit community hospital. Tick. Non-profit. Is medical services a critical public service? Yes. Tick. There you go probably an eligible applicant. Sometimes for-profit organizations are associated with nonprofit foundations. The basic rule of eligibility involves seeing how the nonprofit arm operates. If the payroll, vehicles, building leases, and operational expenses are carried by that nonprofit, then it may be eligible. But most for-profits don't do that. The routine daily operational costs are needed to offset profit and reduce tax burden. 
nonprofit affiliates tend to have a very specific mission that do not overlap with daily operations. So in short, nonprofit foundations associated with for-profits tend not to be eligible applicants. We are providing you a copy of these rules in a simplified manner, like a game card. While it looks like a game, it is a sincere means of helping you track through this process. Click the links below to download this document. Facility is a FEMA term that is a catch-all for buildings, works, systems, equipment, improved or maintained natural facilities. There are interesting challenges with facilities, but I don't think facilities will factor heavily in the COVID-19 grant funding process. Property is not being destroyed by floodwaters, wind, or fire. Don't dismiss the value of facilities as a critical feature of the policy, but we can discount the topic a little bit, I think. So to move on to the eligibility of work, you have huge risk here. People make massive mistakes on the eligibility of work. FEMA is pretty firmly in charge on the determination of eligibility of applicants and facilities. If you are an eligible applicant and your facilities are eligible, then you know this because you've been awarded a grant. FEMA lets go of your hand here. They authorized a scope of work for your organization. People. You must pay 100% attention to 100% of the words in the scope of work. Your scope of work will be written on a form that is called the 9091. You must not only do what is in the scope of work, you must prove you did it in writing on documents that you will scan to PDF. If you run a nonprofit ambulance service and your scope of work states that you must comply with the Clean Water Act, then you must comply with this act and you must find means of proving that you complied. How would I do this? Because this is likely, by the way. I'd find a summary of the Clean Water Act. I'd post it in the break room. I'd email it to the team and inform them of a mandatory training. Do five minutes training on the Clean Water Act and other compliance thingy things that are gonna show up, submit a roster. The email is proof. As a paramedic or EMT, this makes no sense. But to play the FEMA Quest game, you want that point. Go get that point. Seems stupid, but in under 10 minutes of effort, you're done. Clean Water Act aside, the mistake people make is executing tasks that are not authorized. If the scope of work describes picking up blue dots, then you must prove you picked up blue dots. If you submit labor costs for picking up all dots, including green dots and yellow dots, you'll have your labor costs denied. I'll restate this. If the grant scope of work describes funding for picking up blue dots and gives you a budget, say, of $200,000, then your mission is to precisely and exactly pick up blue dots. If you pick up yellow dots, you must not report yellow dot labor costs. If your labor logs and labor reporting is vague, the entire $200,000 may be rejected. If your photographs, logs, and invoices show only blue dots, then you've stayed on the path and you've proven it. It matters. If your labor costs exceed $200,000, you must either stop the work or you must ask for an increased budget. FEMA ties the grant value to the authorized work. These are two sides of the same coin. I've worked on bridge projects. FEMA specified the compression strength of the concrete, the color code type of the rebar within the concrete. We provided lab results associated with the samples during the concrete pour. We provided invoices showing that the rebar type was the right color and augmented that with photographs showing the rebar in place as the concrete was poured. There was no ambiguity. They specified green rebar and some pre precise PSI. We showed them. We executed precisely with invoices, photographs, and lab reports. This example is not off topic. You may have a scope of work that says you need N95 masks or you need this gown of this type. And if you end up buying something that is obsolete or out of date, you may have problems getting that reimbursed, even in these situations. Are you eligible for a FEMA grant for COVID-19 response? The public funds that FEMA provides must be used to complete an essential government-like function. The team executing the grants and paying the bills must be a nonprofit entity, either government or government-like organization, or a private nonprofit PNP that meets FEMA's criteria. If you meet the above criteria, you may be awarded a grant by FEMA to execute a project or mission. That grant will have a precise and detailed scope of work. This grant will have an estimated value and an obligated value. 
you must work within that budget and perform that task within the scope of work. If you perform work that is not in the scope, it is not eligible. If you exceed your budget, you must request a scope or a budget change before you hit that limit. There is no flexibility on this unless you work within the rules and with your team. See, you may request a change to the scope or a change to the budget. You can even request a change to the completion date. You must make the request. FEMA and your state administration team will provide you answers and guidance. Work and expenses that are not eligible will likely not be reimbursed. Did you find this helpful? Do you have any questions? Please let me know in the comments below. Give a thumbs up if you liked it. Subscribe and hit the bell to be notified of upcoming episodes. There's a link for our guides below. I thank you for your interest and I applaud your efforts to support your communities with this fairly complicated task. Let's rebuild better together.